Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us again today. This has been such a rich conversation. Um, we don't have a ton of time together because we had so much to share in our presentation, but wanted to kind of quickly get to a couple of questions. We have a great one from Justine that I want to read out here. Um, so they say this may, be, may not be observable in this survey, but is there a bi-directional relationship with homelessness and sex trafficking? And what solutions exist or are needed to prevent women and young girls from becoming victims of sex trafficking within the context of homelessness and more broadly? So great question, Justine. Um, so in our survey, we found there was a bi-directional relationship. So we found that uh, approximately one in 10 women and gender diverse folks had um, experienced sex trafficking at some point in their lives. And actually a quarter of those folks had uh, been involved with child welfare. So I think there is a clear relationship between vulnerability around housing, uh, as well as sometimes vulnerability around child welfare involvement and um, experiences of sex trafficking. And so kind of distinct from sex work, because we also asked about sex work, certainly we know sex trafficking um, in the context of poverty and homelessness, uh, there is a bi-directional relationship and recruitment in shelters and drop-ins does occur. Um, in terms of solutions and supports for women who are experiencing sex trafficking, I know Covenant House Toronto has been doing a tremendous amount of work and research in this area and has developed specific housing models and support models in this regard. But I know, Kalud, this is something we've talked about before. You might have some thoughts on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's just, just starting off, like really important to recognize the kind of vulnerabilities that land folks in uh, situations of sex trafficking. And so many of that, those vulnerabilities come from not having safe housing or you know, um, folks that are coming out of uh, the child welfare system or criminal justice system immediately falling into really vulnerable situations that then also makes them vulnerable for exploitation. And that's just, again, like I think we talk a lot about in our survey and in our um, literature review about um, the, the kind of like different gaps created by public systems failures that are leading women to fall into certain gaps and cracks. So that I think where when we talk about um, um, addressing the, this challenge of like the, this really big challenge of like sex trafficking and human trafficking um, disproportionately impacting women or gender diverse people. I think housing then becomes such a critical point because housing is what gives folks that safe space, that safe area, that, that security that can help them be more safe and situations. On the contrary, we talk about in the survey sex work and engagement in sex work as one of the reasons why, um, uh, like one of the ways that folks utilize to, to fulfill um, financial um, responsibility, right? And I just, I think it's really also important to recognize that if folks are choosing to engage in sex work, that that be recognized and they have all the the necessary protections that be made available to them so they're not exploited in that area you know so i think it's 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 easy to conflate or not understand the complexity of it but i think it's also really important to acknowledge that folks that are engaging in sex work deserve dignity and deserve protections um, from from you know like good policy and policy that's really taking a close look at vulnerability and exploitation, but also protection and making sure that folks aren't being made vulnerable just because they're choosing to engage in sex work. And, and I think that's just the balance to take care of. But what we're finding really, and I just wanna sum up my point and not ramble, but I just, what we're finding really is many public system failures are leading women to be exploited and then making them more vulnerable to being trafficked. And I think that's where housing really comes in and becomes a core focus. Love that. That's so brilliant, Kalud. I don't know if others have thoughts they want to share on that briefly before we take just one more question. That's okay. No problem. Um, I, I know we're running over a little bit of time, but one of the things that I kind of wanted to pose to the panel was 
What do you folks think are kind of next priorities in terms of making big change around women's homelessness, homelessness amongst folks who are gender diverse, kind of what's it going to take? What do you see on the horizon for us? Um, so anyone can kind of jump in and, and share their thoughts on that. One thing that I really appreciated from the presentation was around the idea that it needs multiple different solutions and solutions that are led by people who have had these experiences um, and women led solutions. So getting away from the idea that there could be a one size fits all approach to ending or even reducing homelessness in this country and uh, looking at creative uh, approaches to low barrier housing, women led housing, different forms of transitional housing and a wide spectrum of a housing continuum. Brilliant, love that, Mary. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Um, I, I think, Mary, what you said is really important. Uh, centering voices of lived experience is one of the most significant ways that we can be inclusive in our policy making uh, and starting to uh, build marginalized voices into the creation of the structures that we see around us is, is really significant in starting to shift them. Uh, I also think expanding conversations about the right to housing and, and starting to uh, build bright space language into the, the policies that we create is going to be really significant. So uh, starting to talk about people experiencing homelessness as rights holders who are being systemically denied access to their rights uh, is going to be one of the kind of new directions that we're going to see more and more uh, in public conversations about housing and homelessness. I think that there needs to be more trauma-informed care, more person-centered care. I think that we need to push the men out and more women need to be in the building, in the engineering, in the designing. I think that um, we need to change the old that is not working and um, get rid of the cookie cutter and start thinking outside the box and start thinking in diverse plus women categories. Um, we need to be more informed by the lived experience and they need to be at way more tables than they already are. And I'm speaking from the ground right up to the federal government. They cannot do this without us. And if they think they can, they're fooling themselves. Brilliant. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Hillary. Marie, can we go to you now? Yes, I was hoping to jump in here. Yes. Um, I think one of the first things that needs to happen is for Indigenous women and women in general to be able to have secure land tenure. Because if you're talking about housing, you're talking about building homes, then you need to have a place to build it on. So you need the land first, and then you need the homes. And I agree with Hillary Marx that women need to be at the engineering table, the design table, the supply table, and also at the table where houses are built. And we need to train women to learn to build our own homes that are specific to our needs and to our cultures and to our um, uh, requirements. So I would just wanted to add that and thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Marie. Kalud or Hillary, maybe we can go to you. Hillary Chapel, are you here with us? Yeah, hi. Um, I think one of the things about building housing and the, I totally agree with Hillary Marks. We need women to focus on everything, especially what we're talking about. But I really think we got to think of a disabled lens too. So when we're building those counters, we keep them at two feet instead of three feet. We put the smaller stoves, Cupboards, accessibility must be accessible. We must think of that in accessible housing. Because right now, I know in Calgary, there's not enough accessible housing for our homeless disabled friends. Absolutely. And Kalud, we'll turn to you for, for a last comment. Yes, I, I just want to thank everybody who's at this table for bringing in their knowledge and insight. It's been so absolutely wonderful working with all of you and continuing to work with you through the network. I quickly want to plug 
folks, um, if they're interested in getting involved in the work that the network is doing, to please um, visit us at, at womenshomelessness.ca. And it's, it's an open table. Everybody's invited. We know that this work cannot be done alone. So we're really inviting all diverse perspectives to please come join us, um, be a part of the steering committee, be a part of our working groups, and help us, help us get uh, the visions realized. So thank you so much to everyone and, and passing it off to you, Caitlin. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have a keynote in 10 minutes with Dr. Buzeri, who is incredibly brilliant. So I hope you're all looking forward to that. And we will see you soon. Please join us.